Congratulations on completing chapter one, the nouns of programming. Proud of you. Good job. Now, do you remember during orientation where I talked about how we would look at programming through the lens of writing? Well, that's exactly why chapter one is called the nouns of programming, because the sections in this chapter, they taught us about the informational constructs that have the equivalent properties of real life nouns. These were the names, the shapes, the tools, the terms, and the constructs that we're going to be using throughout the rest of this course. But before we move on to learning about chapter two, the verbs of programming, let's review what we learned, but let's do it in a recontextualized and abstracted way. Now I was inspired to build our section wrap ups this way because of a single line from Jim Acali's book, Quantum, in which he said, no matter how much we learn about the chemical bonds between hydrogen and oxygen, we can never understand the wetness of water until we step back. And that really got me thinking about what kind of higher level programming concepts that usually aren't covered in a programming course, or that you might already understand if we just stepped back a little bit so you could connect it to other broad topics that you already have in your existing mental scaffolding. Introducing the Python Pyramid. So let's start at the base of this pyramid. Now we can think about all of the details that we've learned from all of the previous lessons in this entire chapter as forming the base of the pyramid. And then we can move up one abstraction level for this lesson. And what we're gonna cover now is the connections stripped of the why and how details. This is the level where our mnemonic memory hack really shines because it gives us a way to think about a link between all of this normally uncontextualized information. We can think of our next lesson as one more level of abstraction up. And this time we're gonna focus just on the sections themselves as if they were the topic. So if the last level was the connections between the hydrogen and the oxygen that we talked about in the analogy to make H2O, then this level would be the equivalent of the wetness of water. The emergent properties that are hard to see when you've got your head down in the details. And then finally, the very last lesson of chapter one is gonna be projects. On this final level, we'll actually look at real life scripts to see how all of our knowledge can fit into real world projects. This puts it in the context of when we're really writing programs, how many times do these kind of things come up? So I think it's gonna be really helpful and it's also really fun to look at all of the actual working scripts. You really get a good feeling of accomplishment to start opening up the hood of that car and looking at the engine. So now's a good time to settle into a comfy chair and get your creative juices going as we review the connections of all of the objects, all of the nouns, all of the topics that we've covered and put them all together in one scene. Okay, so for this lesson, we're going to be going through the accompanying ebook. So there's a link to it down here. This is included with your purchase of the course, so feel free to look over it at your own time. And it's also the basic script that I would read the videos off of. Now, I don't consider myself to be like a great writer, so one of my goals with this project is to get other people to come help sort of make this a Wikipedia type thing for the three chapters where people can maybe uh, improve the mnemonics or improve the answers or... Um, ask some extra questions down here. So if you would like write access, feel free to email me, dylan at dylanjorgensen.com, and just say that uh, you know, you're taking the course and want to fix some of my grammar errors or whatever it is. But for this lesson, we're not going to read all the questions. We are just going to be looking at the topics, the mnemonics, and those connections. So our first mnemonic was the Tron light cycle, and it represented the topic of programming. And the reason we chose it is because inside the world of Tron, everything is a program. And it was great to see how when you're thinking about programming, it's so much more than just a verb. Like writing, it is an action you can take, but it's also a way of thinking. It's about being logical and being really clear with what you're trying to communicate. So we met this guy in front of the gold spike and remember how a shady politician snake paid him off so that he could use this to build a wall between Mexico and the United States. And then that became our second mnemonic. We followed the snake in to meet some other politicians and snakes represent the topic of python probably best to imagine a python snake you know Py you know pythons look a little bit different than that but we just talked about when you're a programmer there's many different languages and python is just one of many one of my favorites obviously but it is just one of many and then those shady snake politicians decided that they wanted to get off the planet because that new tron movie was being made and they were going to jupiter and we Saw this mnemonic, it was a model, a toy model of Jupiter that was hanging in the middle of a dance floor, kind of like a disco ball, and it represented the topic of a Jupiter notebook. And a Jupiter notebook was really important to learn about because that's 
what we use. That is how we are coding. That's the environment that we type our Python into. And there's different ways to do that. You can do it in the terminal. You can do it in a separate IDE. But for us, we love Jupyter Notebooks. And they're great for data science. So we got a chance to learn about that. Let's off over to the bar area for our second section, which was called mutability. And the first and kind of main character that we learned about was a shot glass that represented the topic of a variable for its ability to contain different liquids over time. Then we went and saw that there were certain bottle shapes, and one in particular looked like a typewriter, and it represented the concept of a type, which is really a grouping, groupings of these different variables. And that was on the shelf right behind where the Ninja Turtle was working, and it was just one of those iconic bottles that stuck out. And after that, we went through a discussion as the butterfly was trying to figure out what kind of a shot they wanted. And we learned that the choices all boil down to individual objects. And these were the actual final brands, the different brands of liquor that he could have chosen. And each one had this dog tag around it, which indicated how they have unique IDs. So these objects are sort of the bottom level, the most unique and ungroupable thing that we were going to learn in the mutability chapter. And then we went on to really talk about a bigger concept that all of the three things we talked about before kind of work together to create, and that's mutability. This was our Ninja Turtle and his report card, and we used him because he's a mutant, and his report card was a great example, another way to think about mutability. It's attached to him no matter what grades are on there, but those grades, that GPA will change over time, and that's the process of mutability. And the Ninja Turtle was helping this butterfly who had a long day at work, and the butterfly represented state. And state is a way to say, what was your GPA in fourth grade? What was your GPA in fifth grade? And we like that as a mnemonic because butterflies go through states. They're caterpillars, and then they become butterflies. And you can ask which state that the insect is in. But it really is, I guess, the same insect, even though it seems totally different. So that wrapped up the first part of our mutability section. And then we went on to talk about it a little bit more with Python-specific keywords. So, so we started talking about scope, which was represented by the penguin enclosure, because it kind of gave us that feeling of everything that's cold and for the penguins is in this walled, contained area. And that's scope. But you can have all sorts of different variables in there. And it made sense to think of this zoo concept, because each zoo environment is so different, but they're all right next to each other. And if you remember, this was where the manager had some classy penguins because he was trying to increase the vibe at the party. And then we went over and met a couple uh, nude streakers, and they figured out a way to get into the stadium by getting new names, and they were using these hello, my name is name tags. And that represented our concept of a namespace, which is similar to scope, but the namespace is actually a list of variables. So we could think of that as like the names of all those penguins that we saw just a few minutes ago. And then we went and actually the way the story rolled out, we learned about these nude people first, but they are all connected. So then we had the MIT people, and this was to talk about how the variable also has a lifetime that we can think about as being public, private, or protected. I mean, in general, we just think of it as public, but we can also make variables private. And that was everything that had to do with mutability. So we moved away from the bar and then moved over to the games so we could start talking about some of the basic Python types. So these next two sections really represent nouns. These are actually the objects that we'd be working with in a real life situation. So we group them into two different sections. Our first one was for the types that hold one value and not groups. And we called this one types single. And the first thing that we learned about was a concept called casting. And this was a big caterpillar, if you remember, that had uh, 15 or six, 16 or 18 broken arms or some such, and it was friends with the unicorn. And casting was all about what variables had inside them and if that needed to change some of the general properties or types that were on the outside so that it could perform an action or something, so the context that it was in. Then we started talking about some of these single types, and the first one was the most common and basic type, the integer. This was all of the pool balls that were sitting on the table, and that was great to remember them because these have integers on them. Pool balls don't have decimal places. Then we saw the root beer float. When the giant caterpillar with the broken arms and the unicorn went to go get root beer floats, that represented our topic of a float, which is similar to an integer, but it has more precision. It adds decimal places. And then we went over to a, a dark and disturbing story as we talked about the Grim Reaper and the devil playing a fiddle off. And that was representing the topic of strings, the golden fiddle that they were looking for. And strings we uh, learned can actually probably be in the group section because you can think of each character as sort of a sequence. But we just decided to stick them here because we think of them as single objects. 
because we're going to think of a single word or a single string as, as an object the way we're using it in this case. And we watched that fiddle off, and the, the Grim Reaper did such a good job beating the devil, and he got that golden fiddle. And then the Grim Reaper himself represented the topic of the Reaper function. And we learned earlier about the print functions and some of the basic ways to output to the screen. And we learned that the Reaper sure looks the same, but when it gets down to it, it's printing out things that can be cut and pasted back in. It talks to us the way it would talk to itself, the way it would talk to another computer or another Python program. And then finally, to go back to the unicorn, the unicorn we actually met in the story at the very beginning because he was the one getting the root beer float with the caterpillar at the broken arms. He was the pool hustler. Um, but he represented the concept of Unicode and encodings. And we talked about Python under the hood being able to use Unicode and all those great characters. And that wrapped up our game section here for just the single types. To the last section in this chapter, which was the types that represent groups that can hold groups within them. The first one we learned about was a group of ducks that were walking in sequence, the mother and her little ducklings, and that represented the topic of a list. And we learned that lists are kind of like multiple single values, but we learned some of the specifics about how to keep them together. And the ducks all lived in that ski ball machine. And then we went over to the whack-a-mole game and we saw Morpheus and he was doing the blue pill, red pill thing. And he represented the topic of a matrix. And I, I lumped those together with lists because you can just put lists inside of lists. And as long as they're like integers or floats, it makes it a matrix. And then we went across the way and saw those two clowns that played tubas. And I've started thinking of tuple now also as a toupee. So I, I put a toupee on them in my head, but that's just, just FYI. If you want to add toupees to your clowns, you can or can't, whatever. And we talked about tuples being sort of similar to lists also, but with the exception being that they're immutable. We talked more about that. We went back over to the pool table because we had a group mnemonic over there for sets, and that was wrapping around the integer, so we used the triangle part. This was next to that hash brown, which we'll talk about in just a second, but let's go back to where the dictionary was. So the dictionary was underneath the whack-a-mole machine when they disappeared into the matrix, and that's what allowed the clowns to finally talk, and that was all just set up for that like one lame joke, but, you know, worked for me. And we learned that dictionaries are very different. They're not just like lists with one or two changes. They're key value pairs and they're super powerful. And this is the most important type you want to get familiar with. Understanding dictionaries will open up a lot of ability to actually build programs and do things. And then let's go back over to the pool tables. So the second pool table had the hash browns and then it also had more pool balls, but that one was inside of a triangle. That was the set. And the hash brown represented the hash table. And this was an important thing to connect to the dictionary. In fact, you could probably just throw a dictionary underneath the hash browns instead of putting them on a plate because hash, hash tables are a great way to store key value pairs but not have things be in order. And we talked about Amazon storage facilities and some other real world examples of how a hash table might be useful. And we are now done. We have looked over the entire mnemonic ebook. We have that base level reviewed of the connections. So why don't we go up one abstraction level and talk about what the sections had themselves. We can learn about how H2O has the property of wetness. Next. Subscribe to the Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.